Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2017. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman with theCUBE, here with my guest host, Justin Warren. Happy to have a returning CUBE alum, but in a different role uh, than we had. It's been a few years. Uh, yeah. Tal Klein, who is the author of the Punch Escrow. I'll tour, please. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tal, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it, it, it's great for you to be able to find time to hang out with the tech geeks rather than all the Hollywood people that you've been with <laughs> recently. <laughs> you guys are more interesting. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. Uh, so last time we interviewed you, yeah. uh, you, know, you were working for a sizable tech company. Yeah. We were talking about things like you know, virtualization, everything like that. Your Twitter handle's virtual Tal. Um, so how does a guy like that become not only an author, but an author that's been optioned for a movie, which those of us that you know, are geeks and everything are looking at. As a matter of fact, Pat Gelsinger this morning said, we are seeing science fiction become <laughs> science fact. That's right. So, uh, you know, yeah, tell us a little cool. of the journey. I, I hope you read the book, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there, uh, you know the journey is really about marketing, right? Because a lot of times when we talk about virtual, like, in fact, last time I was on theCUBE, we were talking about the, the, the idea that desktops could be virtual. Yeah. Because that back then it was still like this, you know, you, you know, uh, uh, almost hypothetical notion. Like, could desktops be virtual? And so today, uh, you know, so much of our life is virtual. Like, you know, so much of the things that we do are are, are not actually you know, direct. I was watching this really great video about Apple's new uh, augmented reality product, where you sit in a restaurant and you look at it with your iPad, and it's your plate, and you can just shift the menu items, and you see the menu items on your plate in the context of the restaurant, and your seat, and the person you're sitting across from. Mm. So I think the future is now. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of uh, you know the the the, the movie Wall-E, the animated one. We're all going to be sitting in chairs with our devices, or uh, Ready Player One, you know, very popular sci-fi book that's being done by Spielberg, I believe. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it's very exciting. Tell us a little bit about your book. Uh, you know, we we talk. You know, when I was younger and used to read a lot of sci-fi, it was like, right, right, what stuff had they done 50 years ago that now is reality, and what stuff had they predicted? Like, you know, we're going to go away from currency and go digital currency, and it's like, what? We're, we're almost there. We're there. But we yeah. still have flying cars. Uh, yeah, we're, I mean, you know, the, the, we're, the main problem with flying cars is, is that we need pilots, you know, and, and I think that, I think actually we're, we're very close to flying cars because once we have self-driving vehicles and we no longer need to worry about a, being a person behind the joystick, then we're in really good shape, you know. It's, that's really the issue, flying, yeah. you know, the problem with flying cars is that we are so incompetent at driving and or flying, yeah. it's not our core competency. So let's just like put things that do understand how to make those things happen and eliminate us from the, the uh, equation. Yeah. Right? Everything is a people problem. Yeah. 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 So I mean, when I wrote, okay, so when I wrote the book, uh, the punch escrow, punch escrow, uh, <laughs> when I wrote the book, I uh, really thought about all the things that I read growing up in science fiction, you know, things like teleportation, things like nanotechnology, things like digital currency, you know, how do we make those, uh, how do we present those in a viable way that doesn't seem too science fiction-y? Like one of the things I really get when people read the book is it feels very near future, even though it's set like 100 plus years in the future, every, all the concepts in it feel very pragmatic or within reach. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's interesting. We look at you know what things happen in a couple of years and what things take a long time. So right. you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, it's not like these are new concepts. You know, I've read a great book by uh, uh, you know I, uh, uh, it was Isaacson, the innovators talked yes. about. You go back to like Ada Lovelace. Sure. Uh, and you know the, the idea of what a machine or a computer would be able to do. So. 100 years from now, what, 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 what's real, what's not real? Uh, we still all have jobs or something? Uh, no, we have you know, jobs, the but they're different. Yeah. Like, remember in the, in the, I don't know if you're a historian, but like, you know, back in the industrial age, there was a whole, a whole bunch of people screaming doom and gloom. In fact, if we go way back to the age of the Luddites, yeah, yeah. You know, who, who just hated machines of any kind. Or, you know, the, I think that in general, we don't like, you know, we're, 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 we're scared of change. So what, I do think a lot of the jobs that exist today are going to be done by machines or code. That doesn't mean that jobs are going away. It means jobs are changing. A lot of the jobs that people have today, you know, didn't exist in the industrial age. You know, so I think that we have to, we have to accept that we are going to be pragmatic enough to accept the fact that humans will continue to evolve as the infrastructure powering our world evolves. You know, and it, you know, we talk about the, living in, in the, the age of the quantified self, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff we don't understand how to do yet. For example, I, I can think of a whole industry that tethers my Fitbit to my nutrition. You know, like, I, there's, there's so much opportunity 
that for us to say like, oh, that's going to be the end of, you know, the end of jobs or the end of innovation or the, the end of capitalism is insane. I think this, this just ushers in a whole new age of opportunity. And that, that's me, I'm just an optimist that way, you know? So what, the, the Luddites famously did try to destroy the right. machines, because, but the thing is that the Luddites weren't wrong, they did lose their jobs. Um, so what about the people whose jobs are replaced with, as you say, net new, like there's a net new number of jobs, but specific individuals, like people who manufacture cars, for right. example, um, lose their jobs because a robot can do that job yeah. safer and better and faster than a human can do it. So what do we do with those humans? Because how do, how do we get people to have new jobs and retrain themselves? I, I address some of, some of these notions in the book. For example, uh, one of the weird things that we're suffering from is the lack of welders in society right. today. Because welding has become this weird thing that we don't think we need people for, so people yeah. don't get really get trained up in it because you know, machines do a lot of welding, but there's actually specialty welding that machines can't do. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I, think I think the people who are really good at what it is, at the things that they do, yeah. will continue to have careers. I think their careers will become more niche. Therefore, they'll be able to, to create, to demand a higher wage for it because uh, almost like you know, uh, a carpenter, you know, a, a specialist carpenter mm. will be able to earn a much higher wage day by having fewer customers who want really custom carpentry versus things that can be carved up by machines. Yeah. Right? So I think that, that the, um, what we end up seeing is that it's not that those jobs go away, it's that they become more specialized. People still want Rolls Royces, people still want McLaren, you know, McLarens, those are not yeah. done by machines. Those are handmade. Yeah, you know, that's, so that's an interesting point. So the value of something being handmade becomes a new, yes. instead of it being a worse product, it's a big it's actually concept a, in a the book. Oh, okay, right. A big concept in the book is that we we place a lot of value on the uniqueness of an object, mm. meaning there's uh, and and that that parlays in multiple ways. Like so, one of the examples I use in the book is the value of a Big Mac actually coming from McDonald's. Right. Like you can make a Big Mac. We know the recipe for a Big Mac. Yeah. But there is a certain there's a weird sort of you know, nascent value mm. to getting a Big Mac from McDonald's. That, you know, it, it's something in our brain that clicks, that, that tethers the two to, an, to originality. Diamonds, another really good example. Like, or you know, uh, we know they're synthetic diamonds. Yeah. We still want the ones that get, get mined in the cave. Why? We don't know. Right? They're just special. Because De Beers deal has really good marketing. <laughs> <laughs> so but I think there's, that's, that's the idea. Yeah, so the concept of uniqueness, which again comes right. to scarcity and so on, it's like Correct. as an author, someone who has no doubt signed a lot of his book, right. uh, that means that that book is, is unique because yes. it's, it's signed by the author, right. unlike something which is mass produced and there's hopefully thousands and thousands of copies that you sell. We, we, I've done, going into this actually, thought about that a lot, and that's why I've created like multiple editions of the book. So like the, right. the first 500 people who pre-ordered it on Ink Shares get like a special edition of the book that's like stamped and all this kind of stuff. And like, I even use different pens. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I appreciate that, because I'm also, I'm also a collector. I collect uh, music, I collect books, uh, and I, you know, I, so I see, those, I see those aspects in myself. Yeah. So I know, that, I know what I value about them, you know? Uh, and uh, the crossover between music and books is interesting. So, uh, as someone who has a musical background, yeah. I know that there's a lot of musicians who will come out with special editions, and yes. and you know because it, this is an age where we can download it. You can download the book. Do you think there is something uh, like how is there something in tr that is intrinsic to having a physical object? Yes. In a virtual world, I think to to our generation, yes. I'm not so sure about millennials when they grow up. I don't, I don't, but there are like, for example, I'm going to see you too next week. I'm very or very lucky to see that. Uh, but part of the YouTube buying experience to get access to the pre-sale, you need to be part of their fan club. To get part of their fan club, you need to get, to choose, to, you get like a whole bunch of like uh, limited edition posters and limited edition vinyl and like all this kind of yeah. stuff. So like, there's an experience. It's no longer just about going to see YouTube at a concert. Mm. There's like the entire package of, of you being a special YouTube fan and, and you know, they, they, they surround it with uniqueness. Right. It's not necessarily limited, but there's an enhanced experience that, mm. that can't just be, it's not just about you having a ticket to a single concert. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I'm curious, the, the genre, if, if you'd call it, is sure. hard science sure. fiction. Yes. Um, the challenge with that is, you know, what is an extension of what we're doing and what is, you know, fiction? And yeah. people probably poke at that. Have you had any interesting oh, yeah. experience and things like that? I mean, I, I've written this list a lot of stuff like Andy Weir, like, let the community give yeah. feedback before he created the final of Martian. But, <laughs> so, so, yeah, what, what's it like? Because we what, can, the, the, the geeks no. can be, you know, really harsh, <laughs> I, you know? Yes, I've learned from my Reddit experience that, uh, so <laughs> what's really funny about it is, is the, first, the first draft of this novel was, hard as nails, it was crazy, crazy. And, and my publisher read it, and it would have made all the hard science fiction guys super happy. My publisher read it, and he's like, you've written a really great hard science fiction book, and all five people who read it are going to love it. <laughs> you know, but it became, it was totally, un, you know, unparsable. I, I came here with my, my buddy Dan, he, he couldn't even get through the first three pages of it. And he's like, and he wanted to read it. Like, yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, part of, part of working 
through the editorial process and saying like, look, I really want, I care a lot about the science because mm -hmm. one, of the, one of my deep goals is to write a STEM-oriented book that gets people excited about technology and, yeah. and presents the future as a, not, not a dystopian place. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I wanted the science to be there and to, and to have a sort of uh, gravity to the, to the narrative. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, it's tough. I, worked with a, I worked with a physicist, uh, a, a biologist, a geneticist, an anthropologist, and a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to try to figure out like, how do we carve out, what, you know, what does the future look like, what is the evolution of your, each individual tra uh, you know, sciences. Like we talked about the mosquitoes, right? Yeah. You know, we're already doing a lot of really crazy stuff with mosquitoes. We're modifying them so that you know the males who mate with females that carry the Zika virus, you know, don't give give birth to offspring that never reach maturity. Yeah. I mean, this is just crazy. It's science fiction. Yeah. And now that you know they're, they're working on uh, modifying female mosquitoes into vaccine carriers right. instead of disease carriers. I mean, like right. this, this is science fiction, right? Like, who believes this stuff? It's crazy. Cris so it's CRISPR like, is amazing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, yeah I, I've loved, there's been a bunch of movies uh, recently that have kind of helped to educate on STEM. Some, uh, you know, Martian got a lot of people yes, excited. Uh, you know, Hidden Figures, uh, right. one that, you know, oh, I can yeah. bring my, my kids that are teenagers now into it and they, they get excited, oh, science is great. So, the movie, how much will you be involved, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, what, what can you share about that experience too, so far? Uh, it's, it's been, it's very surreal. Yeah. Uh, it's the word I used to describe it. It's the honest, it's God's honest truth. I mean, um, I've been very lucky in that, uh, my representation in Hollywood is, 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 is this rock solid guy called Howie Sanders. And he's this like bigger than life, you know, Hollywood agent guy. And, and um, he, he's hooked me up. You know, we made a lot of business decisions that were, were focused less on the money and more on the team, uh, which is nice to be like when you're, when you're in your 40s and you're more financially settled, you're not in the kind of situation where you might be in your 20s and you're just going to sign the first deal that people give you. So we, we really focused on, on hooking up with like the director, James Bobin, is a, uh, you know, He's the guy who co-created Flight of the Concords. Uh, he did the Muppets movie. He did, uh, you, you know, Alice Through the Looking Glass. He's a really professional guy, but also really understands the, the, the tone of the book, right. which is like humorous, you know, kind of uh, sarcastic. Uh, he, it's, it's not just about the technology, it's also about the characters. The same thing with the, the production team. You know, the two producers, Mandeville uh, Productions, I was just talking to Todd Lieberman, and we're talking about just what is augmented reality like? How does it look like on the screen? So I'm so not. It's not going to look like Blade Runner, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's going to look a lot. It's going to look real. Okay. You know, I, I imagine. Well, again, I don't know. They're going to make whatever movie they're going to make. But like, <laughs> I, th their perspective. One of the things that, that we talked about is is keeping the the movie very grounded. Like, you know, one of the big decisions. One of the big questions they asked me first going into it is like, before we even had any sort of movie discussions is like, is this more of like a Looper, Gattaca, or District 9, or is it more like the fifth element? You know what I mean? Is it, is it well, like, you know, do you want it to be this sort of like grounded movie that feels authentic and real yeah. and near future? Yeah, yeah. Or do you want this to be like completely alien and weird and like, you know, out of it? And I, I per the story is more grounded. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of, hopefully what we display on the screen will not feel that far away from reality. Okay, yeah. Um, I you, you do marketing in your day job. I do, yes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious as you look at this, kind of the balance of you know, educating, reaching a broad audience, uh, you, you have passion for STEM. Yeah. You know, what, 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 what's your, what your thoughts around th that is? You know, I, yeah. I worry, you know, there's so much you know, general like television or things like that, when I right. see the science stuff, it like, makes me groan. Yeah. Uh, because you know, it's like, <laughs> oh. no, I don't understand that. Oh, you know? <laughs> I, I am you know? the worst, because I'm also, I've got a security background too, so yeah. like, that's, that's the one that gets trampled on <laughs> the war. I mean like. Wait, <laughs> wait, thank goodness I updated my firewall set because yeah. <laughs> I saved the world from terrorists. Hey, we you know? we broke Cybers, through the first, no! Wait, hang on, we're breaking through the first firewall. Now we're through the second <laughs> firewall. Now we're going through the third firewall. There's like 15 firewalls. You know, like it's like, you know, uh, no, and, and they, let me upload the virus, you know, like all that stuff. You know, so it's, it's difficult for me. Like, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, hopefully, there's also a, a group in Hollywood called the Hollywood Science and Entertainment Exchange. Okay. And they're a group of scientists who work with, with filmmakers on, you know, reining things and filmmakers don't usually take all of their advice, <laughs> i.e. interstellar, uh, but you know, I think uh, um, in, many cases, yeah. <laughs> in many cases there's some really good ideas that come to play into it that hopefully bring up, you know, like I think Jarvis, for example, in Iron Man or in uh, the Avengers is a really cool implementation of what the future of AI assistance might be like, you know, yeah. since, and I know they use the Hollywood Science Exchange to figure out like, how's that going to work, you know? Um, and I think in, in my, the marketing aspect is, you know, the reason I came up with this, the, the idea for this book is because uh, my CEO of a, of a company I used to work for, 
he had this whole conversation about teleportation, why teleportation was impossible. And he's like, it's not because the science, yes, the science is a problem right now, but we'll get over it. The main issue is that nobody would ever step foot into a device that vaporized them and then printed them out somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, that's great, because that's his marketing problem. Yeah. You know, that's <laughs> mm. <laughs> Yeah, um, you're dead every time you do it, right? But it's, it's the same Maybe. you, I can't tell the difference. Uh. <laughs> well, that, you, you say you're dead, I'm saying you're just moving. <laughs> um, <laughs> artificial intelligence, yes. you, you know, big gap between kind of yes. the hype to, to where we need to go. What, 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 what's your thoughts on, on that space in general? And I think that we have, it's a great question, because uh, you know, I, I feel like that's a term that gets thrown around a lot, and yeah. I think as a result it's becoming watered down. Uh, so you've got the sort of artificial intelligence where, uh, that comes with like, you know, Google you know, building an app that can beat the, the world's best Go players, which is like a really, really difficult puzzle. The problem is that that app, you know, that app can do one thing, and that's play Go. Yeah. You put it in on a, you know, you put it on a chess game, and it's like, I don't know what's it's going on. It's a very so, specialized kind of intelligence, um, yeah. yeah. Now with OpenAI, you know, uh, they, they just had some pretty interesting uh, implementations where they actually played video games with a real live, in, in a, like a real live, live that, uh, yeah. uh, competition, and, and won. Yeah. Um, again, it, you know, but without the smack talk, which really, I think would add a lot. So you got, now you think I teach the AI to smack talk. So uh, I think, look, we're, the problem is we haven't figured out a really good way of creating a general purpose AI. Um, and it's actually, there's a lot of parallels to uh, the evolution of computing in general, because if you look at how computers were before we had general purpose operating systems like Unix, yeah. every computer was built to do a very, very specific function. And that's kind of what AI is right now. Okay. So hmm. we're still waiting to have a sort of general purpose AI that, that can do a lot yeah, of specialized even activities. most robots are still very single purpose right. today. Mm. So that, yeah. that's the fundamental problem. But you're seeing like, you know, the, the Cambridge guys are, are working on you know, sort of the bipedal robot that can do lots of things, you know. Um, and uh, Siri's getting better, Cortana's getting better, Watson is getting better, but we're not there yet. I mean, like, we, we still need to find a really good way of, of integrating deep knowledge with general purpose uh, uh, conversational, you know, AI. Because that's, that's really what you need to like, Stu, what do you need? Here, let me give it to you. Yeah. You know, and, and do you, do you draw a distinction between AI that's able to simply sort of react as a, as a fairly complex machine, <clears throat> or something that can create new things and, and have the, uh, you know, that's something that's in the book novelty? As well. oh, okay. so, uh, so the fundamental thing that, that uh, I don't think we, we, we get around even in the future is giving uh, computing, computers the ability to actually come up with net new ideas. Mm. There's actually a career, that, the, the main the job of the protagonist of the book, his job is a salter. And his job is to salt AI algorithms to give them, to, to introduce entropy, right. so that they can come up with new ideas. Okay, interesting. They're based off of the, the sort of chaos that he, it's you know, like chaos monkey, it. right? Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's really what you're trying to do is like, okay, react to things that are happening because you can't just come up with them on their own. There's, there's a whole, I don't want to bore you, but there's like a whole bunch of stuff in the book about about how that how that works. So it's like hand carving ideas that are then mass produced by machines. Yeah, I don't know if you guys are going to have Simon Crosby on here. He's kind of like an expert in that. Uh, you know, he, 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 were, he was the dean at King's College, which is like where Turing came from. So he, like, yeah, yeah. he, he really knows a lot about that. Uh, he's got a lot of strong ideas about it. But like, I learned a lot from him in that regard. There's a lot of like, the, the, the snarky spirit of Simon Crosby lives on in my book somewhere. Cause, but he, he's just funny, because he, you know, he's coming from that field, he, he immediately sees a lot of BS right off the bat. Whenever he's pre presenting, he's got, yeah. he's got like a, the ability to just cut through it. Right. Because he understands what it would actually take to make that happen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I, I've, I pres I've tried to preserve some of that uh, in the book. That is refreshing in the yeah. tech industry. So Tal, I, I need to let, let you uh, you know wrap us up. Give us okay. a plug for the book. Tell us you know when are we going to be right. able to see this on the big screen? I don't know about the big screen, but uh, the Punch Escrow uh, is now available. You can get it at Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, anywhere books are sold. Um, uh, it's being it's been optioned by Lionsgate. Uh, the director's attached to it is uh, uh, James Bobin. Uh, production team is Mandeville Productions. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Go check it out. It's a pretty quick read. It reads, it's a, it reads like a techno thriller. It's not too hard. And it's fun for the whole family. I think one of the coolest things about it is, is, is that uh, the feedback I've been getting uh, has been that uh, it really is appealing to everybody. I've got mother-in-laws reading it. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. Like initially I sold it, to, you know, the, the, my initial audience is like us. Yeah. Uh, but it's kind of cool, like, you know, Stu will finish the book, he'll give it to like, you know, wife, daughter, they had nothing, like, and they're, yeah. they're really digging it, so it's kind of fun. 
Excellent. All right, well, Tuck Klein, yeah. really appreciate uh, you coming. Uh, congratulations for me. on the book. We look forward to the movie. Uh, may maybe you know we'll get the cube involved. Uh, you know, d and down the road. Yes, yeah. so. <laughs> and we're giving away 75 copies of it here awesome. at the uh, Lakeside booth. If you guys want to come. That's right. Cool. So. Tuck Klein, yeah. uh, author of the Punch House Girl, also CMO of Lakeside, uh, who, <laughs> who is uh, here in the thing. But uh, yeah, uh, lots of stuff. Uh, Justin and I will be back with more coverage here from VMworld 2017. You're watching the Cube.